On tonight's show, the very talented John C. Riley is here to discuss his work in film and what he really thinks about Broadway. And Tom York of Radiohead will join Heidi May for an exclusive musical performance off his new album, The Eraser. You don't want to miss this. out of the daily headlines and served up piping hot mere minutes later, Americans are being treated to more than their fair share of take your eye off the ball fears reality entertainment. NBC, the network who gave you the 2004 earthquake film 10.5, actually followed up with the sequel 10.5 Apocalypse, which took up two nights of prime time to shift tectonic plates and ratings. What's next? 10.6, still shaking? ABC, infected by fear of ratings loss, recently brought out Fatal Contact, Bird Flu in America. Did you waste a second of your hard-earned quality time on that one? A lethal dose of mutated H5N1 bird flu comes back to America from Hong Kong inside a businessman and ends up killing millions. Could it happen? Well, not really, say scientists. Then why did ABC have to do this? Don't we have enough real stuff to worry about? Or is the real too real to really deal with, so it's better to deal with the hyper-real, the unreal, and the might-be-real? I wonder what the meetings were like leading up to that green light that put fatal contact bird flu in America in motion. A producer looks out a window, sees a bird on the branch of a tree sneezing, says to himself, this isn't the cold and flu season. What the fuck? He checks his desk drawer to see if he has any Tamiflu. He realizes he has no real idea what Tamiflu is, feels the potential fear as he pings his inner ratings meter and is on the phone immediately assembling the writing team as he thinks of all the tie-ins and supportive email that will no doubt flood ABC within minutes of the movie's conclusion. Damn you, birds to hell! What's next on the disaster movie of the week schedule? Restless Leg Syndrome, The Irresistible Impulse, Viagra, Levitra, or Cialis, Old Men Making Hard Choices. This is entertainment? No, it's distraction. China, Iraq, Iran, immigration, rising gas prices, troop casualties, Medicare. Don't let the fierce entertainment door hit you on the ass on the way out as the real world fist cracks you upside the fucking head. Joining me now is John C. Riley, whose roles in films like Magnolia, Chicago, The Good Girl, and The Aviator have placed him in the pantheon of contemporary greats. With roles in two summer releases, A Prairie Home Companion and Talladega Nights, we're excited to have John here today. So thanks for coming in. I know you're a very busy man. Yeah, my pleasure, Henry. It's good to meet yeah, you. Thank you. You might not remember this. Um, it was the premiere of School of Rock. Uh, yes, I was there. I know, and you <laughs> sat next to me. And that's the part you might not know. And, uh, you mean disguise or something? How did I not no, pick sir, that I up? Was, I was on your left side. And so uh, I was busy throwing popcorn at the back of Dave Grohl's head. <laughs> and I was like, whoa, John C. Riley. <laughs> he's a big motherfucker, man. I didn't know. I said, damn, he's a big dude. And you sat down next to me, and I, I was like, I'm just gonna leave him alone. That's what I'll do. My strategy is, I'll just watch the movie. And that's what happened. So I almost met you. I should have gone, but I didn't. I remember um, showing up at that and like wanting to just see the movie, and then I saw this huge press line and all these cameras and stuff, and I did the old duck a do to the side and yeah. snuck in without going past the gauntlet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a big one that night. Uh, yeah. Ozzy and all those, you know, a lot of rock stars going in there. Fun movie, though. 
Um, let's talk about the, the, the two films coming up right now, uh, A Prairie Home Companion and, and Talladega Nights. Talladega Nights is, 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 is a big summer yeah. film. And A Prairie Home Companion, Altman. You know, which is uh, a much different thing. So, uh, can you just tell us about the differences in the films? Well, they're both comedies, you know, which is something I haven't done very much of in the past, at least not overtly. You know, I'm usually kind of the funny guy in the serious movie, but uh, yeah, I mean, the two Talladega Nights and Prairie Home Companion are they are really wildly different. Talladega Nights is sort of a big comedy with Will Ferrell. So I don't Talladega know. I like Nights it. Would be just like one of those big. It'll be like the big, massive strip Yeah, it's mall. about NASCAR, so if that gives you any indication, it's going to be this, hopefully, this big mainstream kind of comedy. And uh, yeah, it was funny doing that. It's funny showing to work up to, uh, to work to do a comedy. Because mm. most of the time, you, you know, most of the work I've done is dramatic parts, and there's something weird about waking up in the morning and going, I'm going to go be depressed. You know, <laughs> I'm going to go and attempt to make myself cry today or whatever, you know. It just doesn't feel like a natural human instinct. You know, usually we try to avoid conflict. And as an actor, you're always in these weird situations like, well, here I go. We've got to go deal with a coke head all day or whatever. Yeah. Like on Magnolia, I just yeah, remember yeah. thinking like, I just don't want to be sad today. I don't want, <laughs> isn't that what you're supposed to avoid? Like, you know. So it was interesting doing these comedies, you know, going in and the whole point is just try to crack each other up and have as much fun as possible. But it's, in a way, it's kind of more demanding than doing dramatic parts, I found, because, you know, something's either funny or it ain't. Right. And you know almost instantly in the room whether something you're doing is funny or not. Whereas the dramatic part, you know, that's sort of up to the director and there's much more subtlety involved. And, it depends how they edit it and put it together, but the comedy is just like... <laughs> You're trying to get laughs, that's hard. Yeah, and it's exhausting. You get home at the end of the day like, oh, you know, it's fun and everything. There's a lot of joy involved, and it, and it feels good to, you know, laugh, but, man, it's demanding. Mm -hmm. You know, and, it was a, and the way Will works and Adam, they do a lot of improvisation, so you do the scripted scene maybe one and a half times, if that, and then it's... All hell breaks loose. It's whatever comes out of your head in that moment, or whatever you're reacting to something that Will's doing, or whatever. And it's sort of like sc screenwriting on your feet, yeah. you know. Well, let's, let's let's talk about some of the parts. Um, I, I'm not gonna, you know, go film by film by film, but kind of overall, they're really heavy. Like the cop character in Magnolia, that's just that was just really hard. You know, it just looked like hard going. Yeah. How do you deal with? work that's so incredibly, well, unrelentingly heavy. I'd leave it all right there. You know, that's, honestly, that, it's like my wife always laughs, you know, because <laughs> it's not like I have a rule, like I do not speak about work, but I just don't want to. It's like being like a cop when you get home. It's like, I just want to enjoy my dinner yeah. now and just relax and not think about that. Like, I just spent the day as Happy Jack in, <laughs> you know, in the 1800s in the mean streets of New York. Like, I, if you're really curious, I could tell you a little bit about it, but I'd rather just leave it there, you know? And and then when she, she comes and sees the movie with me, she's like, oh, this is what you were doing. No wonder you were so grumpy that day or whatever. You know, so I, that's, that's the way I deal with it, you know? And that's the way I deal with this whole life of being an actor and all the public attention and that kind of stuff is I'm really stringent about my private life is my private life and just... You have to fight to stay normal, you know? Just all the, yeah, people all the years of people's perceptions of what you are. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've been on the train in New York on the subway, and inevitably someone will come up to me like, what are you doing here, man? Like, uh, I'm going uptown. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, but you're being a limo. It's almost like they're pissed off that I'm on the train. Yeah, you're, like you're letting them down. Yeah, you're fucking with my dream of what it's supposed to be for successful people. And, like, you have to, like, fight. They're like, no, I'm just a human being, yeah. you know? It is a challenging thing to try to, like, keep your sanity in. Because that, that, to me, is that's the wellspring of my work, you know, that who I am as a person and, and my normal life, that's what feeds what I do. That's how I'm able to reflect human beings is is be amongst them and, and live a normal life. Because I think if you go one thing to the next thing to the next thing, eventually you're going to start reflecting reflections. You yeah. know, 
you do, if you're not spending any real time with people and learning about life and learn and staying in touch with what it's like to be a, an everyday person, it's going to be tough eventually to to reflect a, a sure. realistic portrait of that. Well, that that leads me to my next question. Um, do, do you think uh, coming from Southside Chicago has kept you somewhat rooted, you know, in the real? Yeah, I mean. Yeah, that's 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 where I was born. That's where I was raised. I didn't leave Chicago until I was 22 or something. So I can't say that that didn't define who I am. That said, I wanted to get the hell out of sure. the south side of Chicago. You know, and it's funny. I see movies sometimes that like glamorize the working class or like street life, and it's so romantic. Isn't it romantic to have all these fucked up problems and yeah. deal with drug addicts and crime? Well, you know what? It's not. Yeah. If you grew up in those neighborhoods, it's not. It's you want to get away from that stuff, you know. You want to like you want a more peaceful life. You want and as an artist, you know, which I felt I always was at an early age, you know, I love you Chicago and I love that neighborhood and I wouldn't trade my childhood for the world, you know. Doing plays in my neighborhood and musicals and that kind of stuff, but there wasn't much for me there. I just knew it. I knew it at an early age. I gotta get out of here. I gotta get out of here. I'm gonna die if I stay here. That provides fuel. Yeah. You know, that's very yeah. inspiring. For sure. The momentum of that is probably what made me take being an actor seriously, you know? Instead of just getting a city job or, you know, whatever, you know? Right. I did not know that, because during this interview, you've mentioned the word musical. Yeah. I did not know, besides. Chicago. Yeah. That, so you've done more than one. This is not something new. Yeah, I'm a big musical theater fag from, from way back. Like, that's really where I learned to be an actor because in that neighborhood and where I grew up in Chicago, they weren't doing Shakespeare or Ibsen or there was no straight theater. You know, it was musicals. If you wanted to be an actor, you did musicals. You're, you know, you either had the ability or you t got the ability because if you wanted to do plays, that's what everyone did. So. Yeah, that's that's you know that was my training, that was my background. Then I went to acting school in college, and I kind of turned my back on all that stuff. Oh, that's just trivial stuff. You know, that's not what serious actors do. Serious actors do Sam Shepard and you know all this stuff I was exposed to in college, and that was true for me at that time. But then a few years out, I get a little more mature, and I realized, no, that stuff was really important. You know. And the American musical is an art form. That's one of the few art forms we can really take as our own, you know? Right. Well, what do you think the state of, of Broadway is at the moment? Oh, God. You know, before I came on here, you guys were telling me, the show's totally uncensored. Say whatever you want. You see? Say whatever you want. Which is a dangerous want. thing, because I'm going to piss off so many people. Uh, honestly, most of Broadway I, right now, I think, is in a really artificial place. The real estate is so tough on Broadway. Yeah. That you got to have this monster hit. You have to have. You have to be a success before you open. You know, and so see I, that's the feeling I get. It seems to me that now sometimes it's more about, you know, like pyrotechnics. It's like going to see Kiss or something. Well, you know, to be to be fair, if I'm paying three hundred bucks a ticket, I want. You know what I mean? I understand the audience's desire for spectacle. You're charging me that much money. You better give me something like. And so producers, you know, this reflexive thing, all right, if you want something, we'll give you a helicopter, you know, like, or whatever it is. But I think, I think, I don't, I don't, I really don't see any legs in that, you know what I mean? I, I think that there's this, I think it's a combination of technology with the microphones and how canned everything sounds on stage yeah. and an audience's perception, we, you know, like, for better or worse, you know, we're not a country of readers or anymore, you know, we're a country of, we watch television and movies. Yeah. And so a lot of, I think musicals are trying to meet that. I don't know, I, I actually developed a musical called Marty. It was originally just a story about this lonely butcher who meets this kind of plain Jane girl and they fall in love. It was originally a teleplay with Rod Steiger and then it was a movie in the 1950s with Ernest Borgnine. It won an Academy Award and stuff. But anyway, we took this that story and made it into a musical for the stage with, um, Charles Strauss and Lee Adams, who wrote the um, music and lyrics for Bye Bye Birdie and some of the other, like Annie and old school musicals like that. And it's a real, I mean, it's kind of my answer to where I think the musical's at right now. And, and, and ironic, you know, not so ironically, we're having a really tough time getting a space on Broadway and getting the money to put this show up because, you know, it's not a small show, but it has some of the, I don't know, it's got a human story. 
Mm. It's not about the spectacle. It's, it's just about, you know, it's about what I think, I, it's what I go to the theater for, to identify with the human experience, you know? I'm glad you go back and, and do the theater stuff. I, I admire actors who do. I'm a huge fan of your work. And uh, thanks for being on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure. It really? Beats, it beats other jobs I've had. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Oh, no problem. Thank you. Coming up a little later, an exclusive performance from Tom York of Radiohead. But first, another installment of the IFC Soapbox. My name is Rick Issue. I'm owner of Nude and Gay in the USA, and I am pro-gay marriage. My name is Mark Brown. I'm a gay dad. My name is Jesse Romero, and I uh, represent the Catholic Resource Center. My name is Steve Krantz, and I'm the president of PFLAG in Los Angeles. My name is Robin Tyler, and I'm half of a couple that sued for marriage equality in the state of California. My name is Meredith Ritchie. I am president of United Families California. We believe that there is no better place for a child than in the home with a father and a mother. And that's the basis of standing up for traditional marriage. There is no such thing as gay marriage. We're not asking for gay marriage, just like interracial couples did not ask for interracial marriage. What we are asking for is marriage equality. Homosexuality, same-sex marriage, it violates uh, both testaments, both scriptures. My wife and I have two wonderful sons, one straight, one gay. He's my son, I love him, I want him, don't want him to be a second-class citizen, and I will fight with my last breath for his equal rights. You know, Pastor X over here can try to tinker with marriage, and Pastor Y over here can try to modify it in his church, but we don't recognize it because they've broken ranks with Judeo-Christianity. This has nothing to do with religion. It's about love. It's about two people falling in love with one another, wanting to share their lives together, and wanting to reap the benefits that a married couple brings here in the United States of America. I believe in the sanctity of marriage. I believe that marriage is a sacred union. I just happen to have a wider definition of what that sacred union can be. The sanctity of marriage is violated because now you're trying to give people an alternative uh, template for marriage. Hey, why can't I marry my dog? Why can't I marry my, uh, you know, my cat? We're not asking for special rights. We're asking for marriage equality. We're asking for the same rights and responsibility that would go to any other couple in the United States. It's a relationship that can never produce human life. And if you would follow that to its logical conclusion, it's fruitless. Uh, I think people who really know, uh, uh, know gay people understand that this is a difference. Being gay is normal. The child has a right to have a father and a mother and to know that the government is behind them, willing to stand by that in legislation and public policy. It's very difficult when my seven-year-old asks me, are you and Papa married? And when you try to explain why to a seven-year-old, you realize the idiocy of the discrimination. You just don't mess with something that has been functioning quite well from time immemorial. As a tax-paying American businessman here in the United States who employs people, I do not understand why I have to be considered substandard and you don't. And now, Here's Heidi May with an exclusive musical performance from Tom York of Radiohead. Thanks, Henry. Fans of Radiohead now have even more to smile about as frontman Tom York delivers the eraser. Joined by Radiohead bandmate Johnny Greenwood, here to perform Symbol Rush off his brilliant new album, this is Tom York Uncut.
Thank you again to my guests, Tom York and John C. Riley. We'll see you next time. <laughs>